I'm in Hong Kong, and I'm craving for something this city is famous for, French toast. Hong Kong is one of the food capitals of the world, but not just because of the Chinese food here. There's a unique regional cuisine from this city due to its history of being a British colony for a century. Hong Kong Island is littered with British colonial buildings. And it's because of British influence that this city became the gateway into Asia, giving us all these skyscrapers. But this isn't an architecture channel, so let's talk about the food of Hong Kong, and how it's an extension to the mixed identity of this city. This city has been in a peculiar position for a while. It sits next to mainland China, the people here speak Cantonese, the food here is influenced by Chinese cuisine. But on the surface, it's dressed in Western clothing. English is an official language here. The streets and train stations have English names. The food here is influenced by Western cuisines. There is an entire cuisine here that is a literal mix of Western and Chinese cuisine, and it's aptly named Hong Kong style Western cuisine. I want to show you this cuisine because I think it's an extension of the identity of this city and the people here. I'm heading to a place called a Cha Chan Tang. It's the kind of restaurant where you would find a Hong Kong style French toast. <laughs> so the reason why it looks like this is because instead of a pan, they actually fry this in a wok, which is really unique here. It's such a comfy mix. For a long time, this simple meal was actually unaffordable for most Chinese people in Hong Kong. For a majority of British rule, the city was segregated between the wealthy British and poor Chinese. And that's because in the beginning, Hong Kong was a sparsely populated island with little activity. The British occupied this island during the first opium war with China because they wanted tea and illegally selling opium to the Chinese was a way to get that tea. Long story short, the British won this war, and they kept Hong Kong as an extra prize for itself. But the British didn't immediately turn these small fishing villages into this. In the beginning, the British lived entirely separate lives from the Chinese peasants, segregating the island between the two people. The British ate food they brought over from Europe, and Chinese people ate Chinese food. But that started to change after World War II. For about four years during the war, Japan came down and occupied Hong Kong. It's always Japan. During this time, the British leadership of this territory surrendered and was replaced by Japanese leadership. My grandparents were children in Hong Kong during this time, and it was a terrible experience for them. Hong Kong was eventually liberated by the British and Chinese, and the city returned to being a British colony. Subsequently, China fell into a civil war, leading to thousands of people fleeing into Hong Kong from the mainland. So this city suddenly had a lot of people, and after the Second World War, decolonization was trending. But Britain wanted to keep Hong Kong for strategic reasons, and in order to do that, they had to improve the lives of Chinese people here. This took decades, but Hong Kong was suddenly becoming a really rich city, and more companies started moving here. This rapid industrialization of the city during the 70s and 80s made stuff like French toast and other Western food more affordable to Chinese people. And Chinese people did what they do best. They made a new cuisine. So this is one of my favorite dishes in the world. This is gokju pafan, or big pork chop rice. Oh wow, look at that. I miss this so much. This dish actually comes from Guangzhou, but has instead become a staple in Hong Kong. It was inspired by casseroles from France. The pork chop is usually covered in a thick tomato sauce with melted cheese over rice. And it's the ultimate comfort food. Alright, let's move on to another iconic establishment of Hong Kong. It's bakeries.
So this is Dantat, or egg tart. It was brought over by the British, but its origin draws back to pastel de nada in Portugal. But let's try it out. The outer parts of it is really flaky, but it kind of is made up for by the moist, creamy middle egg part. While egg tarts in Hong Kong are similar to the British style, right next door in Macau, egg tarts are more similar to the Portuguese style. You can see how colonialism plays a big part in the food of a location. So let's try some of the other buns actually. So this is Hang Cheng Bao or a sausage bun. It's basically a Chinese hot dog. It's such a good combination. It's so much better than hot dogs in America. Hot dogs in America are good, but this is so much better. Okay, so this is a Gai Mei Bao. Um, I'm kind of curious to see how good this bakery does it. The Gai Mei Bao can be a hit or miss because the coconut paste inside could sometimes be dry and that would ruin the bun. So let's see how this one goes. Okay, thank God, it's not dry at all. One of my favorite things about the sweets in Hong Kong, whether if it's pastries, ice cream, or whatnot, is never too sugary. It's such a good balance of sweets. I feel like in other parts of the world, especially in other parts of Asia, sweets can be oftentimes way too sugary. After World War II, British culture finally became more accessible to the Chinese population here. Chinese people started eating cakes and using milk, but they did it in a way that suited their taste, something familiar to Chinese food. This began in places called Dingsa, meaning ice room. Taking inspiration from British afternoon tea, these shops served a variety of milk drinks with baked snacks. However, there was a limit to what kind of food these bingsats could make. These shops carried what's called a saibai, or small license, only allowing them to make food without a stove. However, as these places grew in popularity, so did their need to make more food. Eventually, a more encompassing license was given out to shop owners. A license that allowed them to cook in proper kitchens, called a daipai, or big license. Some Hong Kongers opened these places colloquially called cha chan tangs, which literally means tea restaurant. These places are super important to the growth of Hong Kong Western food, where experiments like curry rice and Swiss chicken wings came into popularity. And because they served these at a cheap price, anyone in Hong Kong was able to take part in this mixing of cultures and many of them still do. These cha chan tangs are integral to the city of Hong Kong to this very day. And they're an institution that keeps this city flowing even when times are bad. This importance came to light in Hong Kong during the 1997 Asian financial crisis, a time where many people who were struggling turned to cha chan tangs as the only place they could afford a good meal. And that's why their current struggle to stay afloat amidst the city's rising rent and other social problems is such a personal issue to the people here. There are even some newer restaurants that emulate the food and feeling of a cha chan tang, but charge a way higher price for it. Some people are afraid that this unique kind of shop in Hong Kong is a dying breed under the challenges of COVID, changing times, and whatnot. It's a fear that's been hovering around for a few years now, and there are some worrying signs. But personally, I think the best thing we can do about it right now is to go to them and eat the food there. This is another iconic pastry from Hong Kong, bao lao bao, or pineapple bun. The origin of this bun is a bit confusing. It appeared in the city after World War II, apparently drawing inspiration from a Mexican pastry. But it's also potentially inspired from the melon pond in Japan. Mm. So one of the best ways to eat pineapple bun or bola bao is to have a stick of butter in the middle and have it slowly kind of melt. And it just gives it this extra layer of softness. So speaking of bread, you can also find it in one of Hong Kong's biggest institutions, dim sum. This is a Malay sponge cake, a popular dessert in Hong Kong. There's two major theories on where this dish comes from. One is that it was developed by the British in Malaysia as a snack for afternoon tea with Malaysian influences. Stuff like being cooked with a steamer and using coconut milk. Another theory is that Portuguese sailors brought castel cakes with them to Malaysia, which eventually evolved into the sponge cake today. However, in both cases, the cake was brought back to China via immigrants and has become a huge staple in Hong Kong. 
Also, Hong Kong has taken back a lot of these buildings left over by the British and are now using them for very Chinese traditions like tea. I think all of these dishes represent the very confusing identity of Hong Kong and its people. It's an identity my own family struggles with. My family was born in Hong Kong under British rule. For most of their lives, they were British subjects of the crown. The British identity of Hong Kong shaped them. This version of Hong Kong was their home. However, that home disappeared. In 1997, Britain would return Hong Kong to China, which promised to allow Hong Kong to retain its democracy and relative autonomy for 40 years. Before this happened, my family moved to the United States, where I was born. The stories of Hong Kong that they tell is technically of a place that no longer exists. British Hong Kong belongs to history now, and Chinese Hong Kong looks to be its future. But right now, we're in a weird transition period, where in some ways, Hong Kong as its own city is an identity. There's a lot of arguments among the people from Hong Kong as to who we really are. British influence runs through the veins of the city, but Chinese influence has an umbrella over it as well. Ultimately, a lot of people in Hong Kong resort to calling themselves Hong Kongers because nowhere else in the world is like this city. early in the morning and we're gonna have breakfast at, you guessed it, a cha chan tang. This time we're going for breakfast because there's an iconic dish people eat in the morning in Hong Kong, macaroni soup. So this dish is an interesting mix between Chinese and Italian flavors. It's such an iconic breakfast in Hong Kong that even McDonald's serves it actually, so let's try this out. Actually when I was growing up as a kid, my grandma would always make this for me, so also super nostalgic. Eating in Hong Kong can sometimes be a pretty interesting experience. You can go from having macaroni soup to pork chops to jam toast. It's just such an interesting mix of different cuisines and different flavors from all over the world. I think this part of Hong Kong cuisine is really important to highlight because it's an echo to the history that has shaped this city. Some people prefer to erase Hong Kong's history of being a British colony by renaming its street names and removing any British iconography. And some even fear that Mandarin will eventually replace Cantonese as the main dialect of Hong Kong. I don't really think that's gonna happen anytime soon. But even if it does, this food will very likely still be here, acting as a relic of Hong Kong's history and its path into becoming one of the most fascinating places on earth. Personally, I don't think Hong Kong should forget or erase its colonial history. I know from the point of view of the Chinese, losing Hong Kong to the British was part of what they call the century of humiliation. A time where China was being beaten down by other nations coming to its doorstep and taking land. But at least in the case of Hong Kong, I don't think people here should be humiliated by it. I think they should be proud of it. Because though Europeans did conquer this land, Hong Kong subtly fought back and conquered Western culture, Western food. The people of the city took food that they originally weren't allowed to have and turned it into its own cuisine. In some ways, they arguably made it even better. It's a testament to how when cultures collide, something more resilient comes out of it. This mixture of culture is one of the reasons why Hong Kong sits with many other great cities. It's a place and identity that's so connected to the rest of the world compared to just the country it's in. If nothing else, this food is truly Hong Kong. It's a mix of Western and Eastern identities into something that only exists here, and a landmark to represent what it really means to be from Hong Kong. <laughs> 